Okay, so now we're going to try filter um, this magnetic data that we have here. And you've got to put in the mag map menu. How you do that is go settings, manage menu, click down on extensions. It is a paid extension, so you might not have it. I've got it as part of the educational package, and I click OK. You can see it loads in the top right here. I'm going to click on it, and this first one here is one step filtering. And so um, the first thing we're going to do to our grid is convert it to RTP. And now RTP stands for reduce to pole. And let me show you an image of what it means. Okay, and so this is a slide that I got um, from a great guy, Gavin Self, who did a, a course on just the basics of geophysics. And why we calculate the reduce to pole, you can see our anomaly here in red over a vertical body like a duck has got a negative and a positive um, in South Africa. Obviously this anomaly changes depending where on the Earth you are. So it's going to be different in the Northern Hemisphere, it's going to be um, different close to the equator. But in black here is what the anomaly would be if this body was at the pole, the North Magnetic Pole. So you can see everywhere on the Earth at a magnetic anomaly will look different. And so we want to make it look like it's like an anomaly at the pole just to make our interpretation easier because as soon as you start running filters on it um, you sometimes lose this negative and you might get confused where the body is and what I mean by that is you can see here's the body and it's kind of situated in the middle from where it's going the anomaly is going from negative to a positive so if I run a, a filter on this and somehow I lose the negative and it's just a positive anomaly, I might get confused that the anomaly is directly underneath that positive. But actually it's shifted a little bit towards the south. Whereas now we create an anomaly as if it's at the magnetic pole and this anomaly is directly over the body. So any filter we apply to this, even if it gets rid of this negative signal, it doesn't matter. It will always plot directly over the body. So that's why we do reduce to pole. Analytic signal similarly does this positive anomaly. So first we reduce to pole, then we're going to calculate analytic signal, tilt derivative, and then on this next slide down here, the first vertical derivative. And now you can see in red is our original anomaly. The first vertical derivative is in black here, and it really tightens up your plot. It's a lot narrower, and it helps you um, delineate the edges of your body. So let's give it a try in Geosoft. So we're going to input our residual grid, residual interpolated, output. Again, I keep the whole name um, so that I know what I've done to it. And I'm now going to add on here RTP in the correct filters. I've clicked on the filter button. See, uh, okay, so if we put in a name here and we call it RTP.com, let's check that it makes a con file for us. And then we're going to click on filter one and you can see down here reduce to magnetic pole it's going to ask you several things and one of these is the date that the first survey was flown one is inclination and declination and I must admit I'm not going to remember any of these so I'm actually going to close it and um, push cancel and I'm going to bring up my database next to it here you can see there's inclination and declination and I'm just going to double check here. I've right clicked on the heading and I've got an IGRF. The date I used was 1980-0101. So, sorry, I just want to keep my map there. You can see here my map has got a white boundary. That means I've undocked it from Geosoft. And what that means is you can see if I click and drag it on the screen, these arrows appear. And if I click on this left-hand side one, it pops up. Um, and now the top is blue instead of white. If I drag it like this, I think, to the side, you can see it's become white and it's become a separate window. And the point of this is that if you've got two screens, instead of having to stretch Geosoft to go across two screens, you could undock this window, put it on the second screen, and have um, Geosoft running on your first screen. Um, so let's click back here and drag it back in to bring it back into the program. Okay. And so those are values, so let's go back to MagMap, one step filtering, um, click on filter. Okay, it's lost the name of my RTP, which is fine. I'm sorry, of my con file. I scroll here and I go down to reduce to pole. The date we said was 1980-0101. Inclination, minus 66. Declination, minus, I'm just going to round off to 23. Amplitude correction, you can check it. Um, I'm not really sure what it means, but it does use a default, so I'm just going to leave it blank and um, click OK. 
and let's double check that it makes the con file. Perfect. Okay, so you didn't have to actually have a cron file. Originally, it will create one for you. And so this is my RTP, my reduced to pole image um, of this image behind on the map. Let's take this grid and plot it on the map. Um, I'm going to go grid and image, display on map, grid. Scroll down here and it's this last one with the RTP on it. I'm going to apply shadow. Um, you can do a color bar. I think for now I'm just going to take it off. I'm going to put it on the current map. And let's see how they differ. If I zoom in over here. So currently on is my RTP when I take it off as the original magnetics. And you can see there's a bit of sh a shift. Let's actually first with the RTP just sort out the color scale. So you can see here it's going to go from about, again, minus 20 to about minus 10. Let's triple check what our color scale was for this other magnetic. So if I double click on it, uh, what did I go from? It was about minus 20, sorry, minus 220 to minus 20. You can see Geosoft has changed it by a value of 1. Remember I got an error message when I originally clicked OK here. It's just shifted it so that all the numbers fit fine. So let's use that exact, those exact values here. I don't know if it will um, help or work, but let's see. Minus 220 to minus 20 with a contour interval of 1. If I click OK, again gives me an error. It will shift it for me. Let's click OK. So I've now got the same color scale on both maps. And if I shift back and forward, you can see there's a shift in the anomaly. And this is due to the fact that if you remember that PowerPoint I showed you, if I've got it open still, um, up here, the red is our original map. Um, so a positive and a negative anomaly over a dark body. And then when you do RTP, it shifts it further south and puts one big positive over your body. Let's also see if the amplitude of our anomaly has changed. And um, this is the original data and this is the new data. Let's see if there's more pinks. And you can see it's definitely a broader area of pinks shifted down. If it confuses you, don't you're allowed to um, not understand well be a bit confused by this. This anomaly here doesn't have a negative and the reason for that is it has remnant magnetization so this is a very old body over here and so over time the body has been deformed and reheated and it's lost and uh, its original magnetism and uh, obtained a new induced magnetic field that was stored inside so this has got a remnant magnetization hence the fact it doesn't have a strong negative although if you go further east there, a negative does come out but it's the main story to get out of this or the main point is that magnetics gets a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with old big bodies compared to these smaller darks that are younger um, and don't have a uh, as, as much of a remnant magnetization, if nothing at all. So you can see, as soon as I put on the RTP, it stretches and moves it further south, which is what we're expecting, but remember this final result is going to be not 100% accurate because there is this remnant magnetization that we're not taking into account. So we do it, the reason why we do this RTP is for these um, smaller darks here that shouldn't have that strong a remnant magnetization. So now we're using the RTP to get the anomaly directly over the dark. So when we run other filters, we know that the um, signals coming up on those filters are directly above the body. I wouldn't focus too much on this large old body with this filtered data. But that said, let's go back here and go to one step filtering again. I'm now going to put in the RTP grid and on top of that I'm going to do a vertical derivative and you can see I've kept RTP so I want to know that the input grid is RTP and I'm doing a vertical derivative on it. You can read right over your con file. I've never actually gone back to reuse them so I've never worried too much about the naming but you can give it a new name. Click on filter, click over here on derivative and you're going to, it's a Z derivative, it's a vertical derivative, and it's the first order. So you'll hear about second order vertical derivatives, so you would obviously type here two, but those bring out a lot of noise in the data, but they do really highlight shadow features. You can do horizontal derivatives, um, often they don't give as clear a picture, so that's why most people focus on the vertical derivatives. So let's click OK. OK. Okay, and you can see it's hangover noisy. 
Um, but let's plot it on our map so that we can see what plots where and what's giving us the signal. So I'm going to go to display map, grid, go down here and go vertical derivative. The one benefit of adding onto the name is you can see it's all in alphabetical order and the longer names are at the bottom so it's quite easy to find your file. Like, uh, I'm, not, we can tr well, I'm going to apply shadow but I think it's going to make it look worse. Let's see what it looks like. I'm going to click on current map. Okay, oh no, it doesn't look too bad. Um, so something, I should have clicked on color bar because I actually just wanted to show you. If you go map tools, symbols, color legend bar, and you go here, I'm choosing my vertical derivative. It's not e topo, it's not mag. I'm not actually 100% sure what the units are for vertical derivative. I'll have to look. I'm going to locate it just off to the side here. Remember, I'm locating the bottom right corner. Clicking OK. Oh, maybe. Okay, and it's a whole bunch of zeros, so don't panic. Right-click on it and go color bar. The reason being is that I've got zero decimal places and I need decimal places for this because I want to, the reason why I'm doing this is to show you how small the values are. I'm going to click OK. So you can see 0, 0.0 values. Um, so uh, I would say you should plot a color bar. I often don't find it tells you very much but I have previously been moaned at at conferences for not having color bars. So it's not as informative as the color bars for the, um, the magnetics. Let me put it next to it over here. So the first color bar is the topography, this one's magnetics, and this one is the uh, derivative. I should have put a title. So you can plot it, but just know what your values you're expecting them to look like because they're a derivative, you've got these smaller values. Um, but let's focus now on what are we actually seeing. So this is the first vertical derivative. If I take it away, this is the RTP. I want you to focus in on this area up here. There's a bit of a signal coming through. from. It's either a horizontal dike or it's a sheet. And what that is is a sill is when you have an emplacement of magma horizontally. But at the edges of it, it tilts up slightly. It's like a saucer. So these are the edges of the saucer, and they travel all the way up to the surface. And over here, they actually travel up from 5 kilometers depth. So they are um, quite extensive features. And over here, you can see there's kind of something. I don't know if this is either a sill or it's a, sorry, a sheet, so the edges of one of the sills, or this is a dike. If I click on the vertical derivative, it really stands out a lot more. You can see it going there. You lose it a bit here, and it goes across. So it really shows you the continuity of this feature. You're also obviously seeing this feature here, but that was not hard to miss. Um, you're also seeing a lot of noise. This is very noisy over here. I don't know if it's because there's cultural noise. You can see it's quite s corrugated, stippled. I'm not sure. Maybe there's a, a settlement here, or maybe it's just very noisy data. Over here, this is starting to look like one of these small saucer-shaped sills. Let's see what it looks like in the vertical derivative. Not too much clearer, but you are seeing the edges. Let's see how clear this is. Okay, so you're starting to the, see these shorter wavelength shallow features, which I'm guessing are bits and pieces of these dollarite sills. Okay, another filter you can do is, and sorry, I just wanted to again highlight this PowerPoint from, oh sorry, Gavin Self. When we take a vertical derivative over here, the red is the original magnetics, the black is the vertical derivative, it really tightens it up when it comes to um, the edges of your body and focusing um, all the signal over where the body itself is. Okay, but here we're dealing with these thin darks, so it's not helping too much, but it's focusing in on these sills as well. So let's look at the analytic signal. Now the analytic signal is similar to reduced to pole, you're getting this big positive anomaly over the body. So if we go here, you don't go to one step filtering. Um, you actually go down here to analytic signal. I just want to point at something else out before we move on from this one step. If you click on filter, it's actually giving you three filters you can apply at the same time. So instead of doing the last two steps separately, you could have gone here and gone reduce to pole and put in the details and down here put in derivative and put in the details and push OK and it would output those combined on one grid. So it would do reduce to pole first and then derivative. So that can save you some time. <coughs> Sorry, I like to look at them individually just to see what's changing each time. 
So now for analytic signal, we're going to mag map analytic signal. Input grid, we're going to put is the RTP. Output grid. Um, again, I'm going to click on RTP just because I'm going to add on at the end here AS for analytic signal. And the derivative method, I just keep it as fast Fourier transform. You can read more about that in the help and the question mark. Retain derivative grids, I just leave the default no. Click OK. And it shows up. You can see what I, what I meant about it forming these positive anomalies over the bodies. It's quite blobby. Let's go back to our map and plot it on there. I go grid and image, display on map, grid goes over here to analytic signal and I click on current map okay so let's compare it I'm actually going to compare it with the vertical derivative so you can see it's yeah it's a lot more blobby pink over here these vertical lines I'd say are the flat lines not being leveled correctly you are still seeing this feature coming through here's this other um, dike or power line um, and to just look at these are these sills it's definitely highlighting the sills very strongly um, but if we compare it with the vertical derivative here it's still a lot of similar information um, yeah I'd say up here is probably the edge of another sill so one other filter I'd like to show you is the tilt derivative so again I'm going to input my reduce to pole I'm going to output my um, I'll again choose reduce to pole and just add in here TD for tilt derivative. It also outputs the horizontal derivative of the tilt derivative. So it's just create, calculating the change horizontally of this tilt derivative data. I always find this data extremely noisy, so I never usually use this grid, but you're welcome to have a look at it. So here I write HD for horizontal derivative and then TD or you can write TDR. And I keep the derivative method fast Fourier transform. Click OK. I don't be shocked by the first grid you see. Oh, okay, it's not... I've seen worse. Um, okay, so on the right hand side is the horizontal derivative of the tilt derivative and on the left is the tilt derivative. And it, it makes me think of wiggly worms. Um, you can see here's this horizontal... Uh, sorry, there's this east-west feature coming through that we saw in the tilt derivative. Here's this power line or dark. Here's this larger... Um, and positive regional anomaly in our area so I'm going to close this one because I don't think you get that much more data from it and I'm going to plot this tilt derivative on the map so grid image display on map grid tilt derivative current map and it's nice to be able to just flick back and through them and see different things that you see on one and maybe not on the other so that is analytic signal this is the tilt derivative it's a lot narrow, it's not less blobby. I'd say something possibly that's coming out, but let's see if you can kind of see it on, on the vertical derivative and on the tilt derivative. So over here you can see in your magnetic signal you've possibly got the a circular feature which is maybe a large sill here. So a really large saucer shaped sill. You can see it a bit better here on your vertical derivative, but I'd say here on your tilt derivative you're really seeing this boundary quite well. So just flicking back and forth between the different grids can help you identify these shallow features. Okay, and then when it comes to exporting your data for use, um, you can take your map here, make sure you've got the data you want on the screen, make sure you've got the correct color bar over here, everything's lined up where you want it to be, um, and you would go map, export, and you, your choice here, so you can export it as a KMZ, um, GeoTIFF, ERS, um, for the, what's they called, um, GIS packages, or if you just want to export an, an image, you can see here's PNG, there's also JPEG up here, um, you can even do PDF. So I usually do PNG, but it's your choice. And then here you can view region, will export whatever's displayed on the screen, full map if you've got other components in other areas, selection right now it would just export the north area because that's what I've selected. So I'm going to go on view region, 
dots per inch, um, I go anywhere between 150 to 300. So if I type 300 here, it gives an estimated size down here at the bottom. I think that's probably an underestimate, but let's try. So you click OK. It asks you where you want to save it. I'm going to just save it on the desktop for now so I can quickly get to it. And I click save and you can see it just depends how much data you have on the map as to how long it takes to export it. So you can see here under my, date, uh, under my map manager, if I'm just exporting this image, try and make sure you've ticked off the other grids. Like I should have ticked off this one because I think sometimes it can add to the size of your file. Um, but I could be wrong. So I'm looking here at desktop. Let's see how big it was. Um, right click, detail, properties. Okay, so 1.75 megs, um, which is a bit too big, so I would go and reduce it. I try to keep it under a meg, but let's just check the resolution. A pretty good resolution. Sometimes you've just got to check um, this north arrow, whether it's always clear enough. I, I struggle sometimes with the resolution of that. Um, let's zoom in. And scroll to the side. Okay, so it has come through. Sometimes I find it a bit narrow. It doesn't always show up when I um, like create an image in Corel. So just be careful about that. For so our study area, we have topography data. But what happens if you don't have topography data? You can actually use this option, this menu here in GeoSoft called Seek Data. So what you need is a grid of your area. So I've got my grid here. I have a suspicion it needs to be in lat long though. And so how you take this grid, you can see this is in UTM. And convert it, you would go grid and image, utilities, reproject grid file. I select the grid file I want to reproject. It's this residual Karoo. I click next. I really just need this grid file for the boundaries, the coordinates of our area. Okay, and it's picking up the coordinate system of that grid, and I click OK. And I'm going to put in the new um, name for this grid file, for the reprojected grid file. So I'm going to choose, this is the original one, and I'm just going to add on here underscore geog, because I'm changing it to geographic coordinate systems. And I literally, in the second option here, the new coordinate system I want to be geographic, and I click OK. And I click finished. And I think it doesn't pop up automatically. Oh no, it does. There we are. And you can see this new one says jog in the name. And if I put my mouse over it in the bottom right here, you can see it's in lat long. And so now I go to seek data, seeker. And if you leave it, um, depending on the speed of your internet, it should pick up the study area of the map you've just loaded. And you can see it's just loaded it. Previously, when I've done this, when it wasn't in lat long and it was in UTM, it actually took me to the wrong region because it wasn't, it doesn't automatically pick up your coordinate system. It seems like it needs to be in lat long. Okay, the next step here, you click on results and it gives you all available data for this area. Okay, and this is all the, these are all the data sets available. So you can see under SRTM here, um, it says one arc second. If you go to the world ones, um, there's other different crustal models available here. Let's click over here. So there seems to be an um, a, a SRTM one for Southern Africa, and then an SRTM. I think this is one arc second. This is three arc seconds. So I'm going to click on this one, which should be higher resolution for Africa. And now I click on download. Okay, and then you change. Make sure you've chosen the directory you want to save it. Click down, load all. I've already got it, so I've got to click over right. Click accept. And you can see it says extracting grid. Okay, and then this window remains open, so you just got to click close. And you can see this is the DM file, and I mean, that's pretty high resolution. Okay, so say for example, I didn't have topography in my database, and I want to load in a topography channel. Okay, and so let's make a new channel here. I'm going to call it eTopo Seeker because that's where I got this data. So literally at every point in this database, I want to search through this grid and find what the elevation is there. So you go grid and image utilities, sample a grid. 
So X and Y, those are fine for your values. It should pick it up okay because this is geographic and that's XY. You could change it. Maybe let's just change it to longitude and latitude just to be safe. Grid sample channel, so we want to output all of our values to eTopo Seeker and we want it to sample through this SRTM data. And um, let's just move this to the side here so we can see the full name. Um, I, I'm assuming it's this first one SRTM Southern Africa. Uh, this heading here it seems a bit wrong. I, I, I think it's loaded in the data into this map. So even though that's the name on this map, this is the actual name of the grid file. So when you click on it, click OK, it samples through and you can see it's picked up the eTopo values here. 